All right, so now that we looked at visualizing LiDAR data and branding, reading it in, filtering it, creating last data sets, um, we're going to look at actually deriving some products from it. So specifically, we're going to look at creating some raster services from, from the data. Okay, so before you do anything else, um, before you do any rasterization, you need to make sure you have the correct filter. So to begin with, I'd just like to make a DEM out of the uh, ground returns. So to do that, I need to make sure I just have the ground returns in the filter. So we're going to set this to all returns here and then ground. So basically anything that's ground will be included, anything that's not ground will not be included. Okay, and now that should be honored in all uh, the, um, all the tools that we run now that we're using that data set. So I'm going to use this last data set to raster tool. It's in conversion tools. And what we're going to do is input our last data set. We're going to name our output. So I already did this once. We're going to call it dem2.img. And we have to decide what we're binning. So in this case, I'm going to do elevation. You can also work with, oh, sorry, turn this off. You also can use intensity data or RGB data if available. Then you have to pick a method to do the interpolation. So we're going to use binning method, take the average of the values within the cell, and then we'll do a linear void filling. So we don't have any voids. Uh, we'll return a floating point output, and we'll, get, we'll create a surface with a 2 meter spatial resolution. And that should do it. So let's hit run and see what happens. Uh, as a side note, um, this data set could support like a half meter to a meter of pixel sizes um, based on the point post spacing. I'm just doing this at a 2 meter so it doesn't take forever to process. Um, if you run these type of tools over large extents or, and or use a small file size, they can take some time. Okay, so you can see I already generated that output. Again, this isn't a very large extent. So we have a DEM. Um, let's look at just generating some terrain output from it. So to do that, I'm going to go to Analysis and Raster Functions. And we're just going to create some grids in memory. Okay, so first thing, let's just create a hill shade just to visualize the data. So we're going to throw in our DEM. You can either do a traditional hill shade or a multi-directional hill shade. We'll just stick with traditional. If you do multi-directional, it just uses multiple sun positions um, and then you know, kind of averages them. Here we're just using one sun position. So the sun's in a northwestern position, 45 degrees above the horizon. And um, we don't need to do any scaling or set a Z factor. So this should be fine. So let's hit create new layer and we should get back a virtual hill shade. So you can see it's pretty detailed. You can see a lot of texture here in the, like the fluvial, um, like the, in the streams, in the floodplain. Yeah, you can definitely see some like road networks. You can see where a bridge was removed there. Um, so again, this is pretty quality detailed data. Okay, so that's one example. Um, let's generate now, um, let's generate a slope surface. So I'm going to click on slope, and we'll do the DEM again, and we'll do create new layer, and there we get a virtual slope grid, um, which again is pretty useful for visualization purposes. You can use this like as a slope shade, as as an alternative to a hill shade. Um, here is an aspect surface. Oops. So the compass direction the slope is facing. This is a combination of slope and aspect. So you have different codes, different slopes, and slope and slope direction combinations. And then lastly, here's a curvature surface. So let's run that on the DEM. And this is basically a measure of curvature. So we've got these, our low values are um, concave, like the valley bottoms there. And then the higher values would be like a convex surface, like a ridge top or something. Okay, so those are some virtual terrain surfaces that were generated from our DM, which we generated or interpolated from our LiDAR point cloud. So I'm just shutting some stuff off now. So we go back to the DEM. Okay, so let's say we wanted to create a surface that had above ground features in it along with, uh, um, along with the, uh, the terrain surface. 
So to do that, we'll just have to rerun our last data set to raster tool, but this time we need to change the filter. So I'm going to go back to our last data set and go to properties. And then we want to change the filter to either ground or unassigned. And we only want either single returns, let me clear this out, so single returns or first of many. So we only really want either returns that were the only return from a laser pulse or the first return from a, a laser pulse. Right, and we'll hit OK. And now if we go back to geoprocessing, go, sometimes you have to go in and out of the tool to make sure it honors the changes, like the filter change. And I'm going to call this dsm2.img. And again, we want to do elevation. We'll leave the same methods, except instead of doing average, we'll do max now, since we're interested in like height. Uh, we'll leave it at floating point and then set it down to two. Another thing we could do in the environments is set the snap raster to our DEM so that it aligns with it. Okay, and then we'll hit run. And we should get back our DSM. This one may take us a little bit longer because there's probably more first or single return, first of many or single return points than just ground classified points. So there's going to be more points to use than the interpolation process. There we go. So this is a um, DSM or digital service model that has above ground features. In this case, you know, trees and buildings and whatnot. Um, and then to get an NDSM or a normalized digital surface model, then we can just simply subtract those two surfaces. So to do that, I'm going to use raster calculator, and we'll just take our DSM, and we'll subtract from that our DEM. And we'll call that NDSM2.IMG. And run. Okay, so here we have an NDSM. You see the range is negative 3 up to 95. I wouldn't really ever worry too much about the high and lows because you're always going to have some weird values with these. Um, what's more important is whether features have reasonable height. So like this is a building rooftop. So if we click on it, um, it's 4.4 .4 meters. That seems reasonable. 6.5 meters, 5.9 meters. If we click on a tree, we're looking at 30 meters. So that seems reasonable. So that's an NDSM. Again, if we wanted to, we could change the symbology or make it, let's see here, symbology. Maybe we'll just change this to like a green ramp if we can find, there we go. So there we go. So we've got our darker greens are our taller features. Um, I wouldn't, one thing to note, I wouldn't call this a canopy height model because it's the above ground features are not just trees, right? So a lot of this stuff like this is all trees for the most part. But we also have buildings and stuff. So that's why it's an NDSM as opposed to a canopy height model. To get a true canopy height model, you'd have to just have the trees in the ground or remove any other above ground features, which would obviously involve more work. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to show you was how to generate a, um, a uh, intensity image. So to do that, we're going to use the same filter. So we're, just, we're going to get like a first return intensity. So it's just a first of many or a single return, any classification. And then we want to go back to our last data set to raster. And uh, let's see, we want to do basically the same thing again. And we'll call this first int to dot img. Oh, I already did that. Let's call it first dot img for now. Save. And we use, now instead of using elevation, we want to use intensity. And We'll use binning, average, but now instead of doing linear void filling, we're going to do no, none. Because if you have, you can have cells without any returns in them, and that might be because the energy was completely absorbed, so like in a river or something. So we don't really want to fill with the 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 value from the nearest non-null cell, and we'll set that at two again, and that should work. Okay, so let's run that.
So again, basically the same process instead of we just are changing what the value that we're interpolating and we ch made some change into the interpolation methods. Okay, so this comes out as kind of a weird output um, and that has to do with the, the way the data is kind of skewed. We have some outliers and whatnot. We also have some like null values and data gaps in here. So let, I want to do a couple things to this to actually make it look good and we're going to do these with a uh, raster calculator again. I'm going to get a raster calculator. First thing I want to do is I want to take all the null values. I actually want to fill those with zero. So we're going to do that with a con function. So we want to do conditional. So we'll do con. And then we need the condition. And we're searching for values that are null. So we'll do it is null. And what is null? The grid. And then what do you want it to return if it's null? Well, in this case, we want it to return zero. And then what if it's not null or false? We just want to get the original value back. So we'll just feed it the grid. OK. And then we need to change the name of this. So we'll do first 2.img. Save. And then we'll hit Run. And that should fill the null gaps. OK. So that should have filled our null gas. We still have a weird distribution. We have some weird high values. So what I'm going to do now is basically the same thing, but I'm going to just take any values that are really high and just convert them to 255. So basically we're going to stretch from 0 to 255. So we want to do con again. And this time we want to do if the grid is greater than 255, we're going to have it code back to... 255. And then if it's not, then we just want to return back the original cell value again. And I think that will work. And we just put a 3 on the end. I think that will work. Let's see. OK, cool. All right, so there we've got an intensity image that actually kind of makes sense. Um, so just look, see if we can understand what's going on here. So the river is brace is basically black. In fact, there aren't many ground returns in the river. And that's because this is a near infrared laser and water tends to absorb most of that energy. So you're not really getting returns off of water. The vegetated areas tend to reflect a good bit of the near infrared. So in these like agricultural fields are pretty bright. Again, vegetation reflects near infrared radiation. Um, surfaces like pavement, like here we have some streets. Those tend to absorb the near IR. So again, they show up pretty dark. We get some variability here with things like rooftops, but generally they're pretty dark. Um, the forest may seem strange. It's pretty dark, right? So um, it's vegetation, so you would think it should reflect a lot of near IR radiation, which it does, but the issue here is that this energy is actually being broken into multiple returns by the forest canopy. So that decreases the amount of energy from the first return if there's subsequent returns. So you tend to get a lot of texture there and a lot of like darker returns. So in short, this is correlated with land cover, but is impacted by other things such as the scanning geometry and the moisture content and whatnot. But it makes for some really interesting images that helps help you inter they can help interpret the, the LiDAR data.